Hey everybody, it's Tom and I'm coming to you for a quick video today from Highland Coffee House here in Cincinnati, Ohio. A pocket of bohemian intensity, uh, like this backdrop of a relatively conservative metropolis all in all. And what I want to talk about, uh, albeit in a sketch fashion, some thoughts from the discovery of being Writings in Existential Psychology by Rollo May. As one may infer from the subtitle, the project of the book is to articulate how certain notions that we inherit from the tradition of existentialism can positively inform the tradition of psychoanalysis. And in tandem with that potential enrichment of psychoanalysis by existentialism. The book opens with a rather uh, interesting gloss of how both of these emerge from uh, similar, well, and more or less coeval social context. That is the increasing fragmentation of our sense of identity and self, which comes in the wake of modernity and the kind of disillusionment with the ideals of modernity that begin to really uh, assert themselves uh, both in the late 19th century as apprehended by people such as Nietzsche or Kierkegaard, both of whom figure prominently in this text, but also subsequently again in the 20th century where upheavals such as lots of the world revolutions and World War I and World War II, also uh, were pushing us along a, a line uh, which made it increasingly challenging for the individual to come into a relationship with meaning conducive to who and what they are, who and what we are, and fulfillment, for lack of a better word, right? So, you know, from there he then, after that historical sketch goes on and flushes things out concretely. But we want to keep it brief, so relatively brief. So I just wanted to highlight one of many notions which uh, May articulates, I think, in a very um, accessible and uh, compelling way in the text. And that is how our relationship with the future is actually what determines the significance of our past. There is an impression that in a way we are imprisoned by our past, determined by the events which lead up to this moment. There is the uh, inescapable net of causality. Uh, however, interestingly, this is a kind of trick of perception. In, one manner in which this becomes apparent is how memory is the medium through which we relate to the anterior, to that which has come before. And yet memory itself is already an interpretation of what has come before, an interpretation which informs our action, our decision in the present. But it is not simply an arbitrary determination. It is one, or interpretation, it is one rather which derives from the principle of our future. In other words, it is where we think that we are going which acts as the rubric through which we understand our past and even emphasize this or that portion of our past and looking to the past for compass or guidance as to what we should do in the present. And this inverts uh, the sort of everyday way of thinking about uh, life and our affairs in a way which is hopefully startling and provocative because it reconnects us with the notion of a fundamental freedom. Fundamental freedom which is anchored in the very indeterminacy of the future. 
or approximate indeterminacy, right? So, we really let this alternative vantage simmer in your person. I think it can have a potentially emancipating consequence for your person. Because you realize that the vectors, force that were pushing you from behind into where you are now derive their reality in a very substantial way from how you are electing to see that past, to see those forces. And it is implicit in the way that you are looking at your future, a way which incidentally may not be entirely, if you like, conscious. Or in so far as it has a kind of consciousness in it, perhaps there's a lack of deliberation as to its contents. Uh, nonetheless, there's a capacity to revisit that deliberation and perhaps begin to approach the future in a different way, a way which allows you to escape from whatever confinements the past that you inhabit at the moment whatever confinements that past are drawing around you, is drawing around you. So, so anyway, I thought that was a very nice little way of putting the matter uh, from Rollo May, and it's sort of connected with the articulation of other themes, for example, that we don't live in just one world, that our world has at least a kind of triadic structure to it, or there are layers or strata. So for instance, there's what in German is known as the Umwelt, which is sort of what we ordinary th ordinarily think of as a natural or material world, which is the context of our existence. But in this world, everything is sort of objectified. There's no real agency. And the human world, the world in which we inhabit, while having the Umwelt as part of its context, also has the Mitwelt, or the world with. Hey, Craig, how's it going, my man? Let me see. Oh. I didn't have my glasses on, so I actually literally could not read your comment. It was blurry for me. <laughs> but I will respond to it when I uh, jump off here. Um, it's the social world in terms of how our existence is determined you know, by our relationships. And then there's the Eigenwelt, which is our own world, or the innermost world of what it's like to be a subjectivity relating with being. Those are all very rough glosses, but that's also something that he goes into with a measure of detail. And then he interconnects all these themes that he's drawing out of existentialism and notes how they ramify for psychoanalysis. Maybe I'll do a video at greater length elaborating how he flushes that out. But what I would do is I'd really exhort you guys to check out this text by Rollo May or another book by Rollo May, um, Ray Hepcat. And uh, I'm gonna, I guess we'll wrap it up here for the moment. I just want to get a little video out there for today. Thank you for watching Craig at all. And uh, I'll catch you guys on the flip. Bye.